Nick, you're not going to believe this, man. What's wrong with you? I have amazing news. We're back. For real? Yeah, it turns out that some asshole got lazy and just didn't want to animate us. Wait, what? And you're not going to believe what they have us playing. What? What's wrong? Yeah, I've learned not to get my hopes up, Doc. Okay, well, this one's a game from... Let me guess, your childhood? Yeah, how did you know? Yeah, and I bet you got a story from your childhood linking the game to the video, don't you? Uh... Yeah. Alright, well, why don't you just skip all that and tell me what game I'll be forced to sit through? Yeah. You know, I could do that. But no. Right around the time I was old enough to start working, the Super Nintendo was on its way out. The N64 was looming on the horizon and PlayStation was about to take the title of the most sought after console on the market. It was around this time that I could finally afford a Super Nintendo. And one of the first games I picked up is the game that we're gonna be looking at today. Now we're playing a Super Nintendo game? That game's nearly 30 years old. It's older than I am. That's right, because it's my job to torture you. And I love what I do because you make it so easy to hate you. So buckle up. <laughs> because this is going to be a saccharine sweet romp through a colorful cartoony world meant for babies and man babies alike. So get your f***ing bib ready because we're going in raw, p Before we start, I need to put down a few thoughts. This is a game that was made at a time when the only people who really played games on consoles were kids. You know, like me. It was marketed and targeted to be sold to little kids because the Super Nintendo was thought of by many as a toy for kids. Now, these kids have grown up, but they haven't grown out of their fondness for old games like this. In fact, I love everything about this game. It was, before I got started in this YouTube bracket, a game I used to play every year at work, while I was supposed to be actually working for a living. Giving you that background is important because this isn't a grimdark game. This is a colorful, storybook-like game where you hurtle through time, hanging out with cave women, fighting vampire elf dudes, and horrors from beyond time. Storybook. So in other words, annoying and boring. Have you ever heard the expression, there are no boring things, only boring people? Yeah? Have you heard the expression, suck my balloon knot? When you boot the game up, you get greeted with this really kick-ass early 2000 era cutscene, fully animated like games like Wild Arms used to have. Now you weren't lying about the storybook vibe. The music, the scene, I think I get it. Now this game has dinosaurs in it? It's got all kinds of shit in it. Yeah, smash that asshole. Okay, the music, the anime, it's got me hyped. It's the whole game like this? Uh, sort of? You start off the game as a kid with a mom and a little yellow cat that makes an adorable little cat sound when you talk to it. As you can see, I started the game off with a high resolution graphics setting, which is a huge mistake because all that does is make the graphics all screwed up and not tile correctly. The best way to play, in my opinion, is to play with the original pixelated graphics. Yeah, the high res patch looks like shit. Sorry, not sorry. After your mom wakes you up, she tells you that the town fair is today and it's time for mom's soap opera, so you need to get the hell out of the house for a little while. And it's from this point that you are able to, pretty shockingly, go anywhere you want. Uh, Doc? Yeah? Uh, I'm getting the distinct impression that I'm playing a JRPG. Yeah? Because I hate JRPGs. Yeah, but this game isn't like those games in a lot of ways. The game doesn't do a whole lot of linear stuff like guide you from cutscene to cutscene by hand. It allows you to explore, get lost, talk to people you have no reason to talk to at the moment. And when you do all those things, you get rewarded with a little extra info that helps guide you from objective to objective. The game uses what I like to call breadcrumb design. Every morsel of info that people give you leads you to the next objective. And unless you're a chud brain, it should all be easy enough to follow along. Well, most of the time that is. Yeah, but I bet it's got all that annoying same shit that JRPGs always have. Yeah, like what? I bet it's got turn-based combat. It does, that's true, but even that has a few differences. Like what? Well, like the fact that positioning on the battlefield is important. See this guy? Yeah? Well, he's the first enemy you'll likely run across. Notice that when he's close to me, every time I hit him, he counterattacks me. But when he's too far away, he can't counter my attacks. This is a mechanic that's repeated throughout the game, and it shows you everything you need to know in the first combat scenario. Then comes the most obvious thing that's different about combat. Did you notice anything different when combat started? Look, up until now I vowed to never play a JRPG, so what exactly am I going to compare it to? 
Okay, fair enough. Notice that the combat happens right where you're standing. You don't get transported to a different location or a battlefield map. It all happens in real time, right in the place where you ran into the monsters. And the biggest thing is that this game addresses the long time problem of random encounters. Instead of random encounters, every encounter is static and appears in the level. And you either have the trigger to start the battle or if you're quick enough, you can avoid the fight altogether. Thank God. Anyway, so your mom wakes you up and it's off to see the fair. There's a surprising amount of stuff to do here. Watch the races, steal some candy, return a cat to a little girl, run into another girl and cop a feel while you're at it and pretend it was all a big accident. All this stuff is optional too. You don't have to do any of it if you don't want to. This is another thing that the game does that most JRPGs don't bother with. They managed to make side content, not just make side content, but they made it fun while they were at it. When we get to the demonstration, we find that it's already underway, and no one wants to get into the machine that they built because in this universe, everyone has already seen the fly and they don't want to get brundled. But Chrono's the only person who hasn't seen the movie and he stupidly decides to become a test rat. But I got a question. How do we know that that's the original Chrono and not some kind of clone reconstituted from his DNA? Who cares? Eventually they ask for another volunteer and a chick that's been following us around decides it's her turn because she doesn't know the incomprehensible horror that comes with the thought of being snuffed out of existence and sleeved into another body as if nothing happened. And instead of getting Brundleflied, she gets back to the future. Now, before we get too crazy with the main mission, we need to talk about this game's endings. What do you mean endings? I mean what I said. The game has multiple endings. And by multiple, I mean there are about 13 different endings and a bunch of permutations based on things you either did or didn't do in the order that you did those things in. That's kind of rad. Yeah, I know, and it gets better. This is one of those games where, if you're good, you could beat the game in just a few hours of playtime. And there's an easter egg ending for that that leads you to an area where all the people who worked on the game have an avatar and unique things to say. And it's a game about time travel so there's all kinds of ways to mess up the timeline of the game like giving Frog some Viagra so he could drill out Queen Lean and create an alternate future where the kingdom is ruled by half frog half human freaks. Or a timeline where dinosaurs rule the earth. This game fucking rules. And it's a game about time travel that acknowledges how difficult the endings of a game like that would be, and it came out on a console and a little cartridge with barely any memory by today's standards. This game deserves all the praise it gets heaped on it. It's a miraculous achievement. Careful, Doc, you're gonna bruise your knees sucking a game off like that. We get spit into the forest just outside of town, but when we visit the inn, something seems different. First off, there's no fair, and everyone is talking about a war. So it's obvious that this time is not the time that we came from, but a different time. All the extra dialogue that was written to make this believable is pretty impressive if you ask me. So we head off to the castle in the distance and roam the forest in search of loot and EXP. I'm not gonna lie, there's something satisfying about the combat in this game. What do you mean? I mean it's easy, you know, fast paced and there's not a whole lot of waiting around for things to happen. I like that. Plus, you don't have to wait for battle transitions to happen, which is kind of nice. Yeah, when we get to the castle, we're stopped by guards, but the queen of all people comes and puts them in their place. That man is my friend, and I won't have you treat him like this. Yeah, but there's something weird about his look, your majesty. What the hell did you just say to me? It's requested that we head up to the top floor to see the queen, and we do so. 
But on the way there, we talk to many people that comment on how the queen looks younger. And I'm sure that the king's noticed. Like, how long do you think she's been there? And how long do we have before the great-granddaughter has to take her dusty old relative's dick? She thanks us for coming to save her, and before we get our heroic reward, she complains about having cramps and says this isn't the right time. And then she disappears, just like all the other women in your life, huh, Doc? And on our way out, we meet our friend from the future, Luca. She comes to dump a bunch of exposition. See, here's how it goes. Queen Lean popped out a baby, and that baby later grew up and had another baby. These steps repeated until the crazy girl that was following you around, Marl, was born. Going back in time and being mistaken for the queen means that Marl was never born because the original king never got a chance to fuck up his pullout game and instead, those babies were aborted before Greg Abbott had a chance to suck out their stem cells. So now we're tasked with getting the real, older looking queen back despite the king's protests, and how we do this is to kick around town, and some of the townsfolk will give you directions of where to go, including this vagabond here, Toma. But the next place we need to go is the cathedral looking place over here. After you find the coral pin that the queen was known to take with her everywhere she went, you're ambushed by some Nagas. Nah, Jesus, Doc, that's their word. I don't think you can get away with saying that. Are you trying to get us killed? I said Nagas, you fucking idiot. Anyway, the Nagas are easy enough to put down with what the game calls a combo technique. Shortly after that fight, we're ambushed from behind once again. But this time, we're saved by this little cutie schnookamookums. His name is Frog, and he's the best character in the game, save for the robot named Rob. Uh, is, is this cute shit part of the torture? Yes. There's a ton of fights in here, but unlike many RPGs from this era, that's not all there is. See, most dungeon design and JRPGs from this time period had a very simple philosophy. Two branches. One is the chest, the other one is the right way to go. Sometimes there's a dead end, but that's about as complicated as these things tended to get. Chrono Trigger is more like Western RPGs in this regard, as the dungeons are a little more like real places, at least early on they are. They rely less on old school dungeon design. There are side areas, but inside each of these side areas is something really cool, like these guys who think you're a monster in disguise, or the monsters pretending to be the king and queen, or this secret place of worship off to the side where the monsters revere their edgelord king, the fiend lord. By the end of the castle, you'll find the real queen about to be eviscerated by a fake chancellor, and it turns out that he's a big goop monster named Yakra which is appropriate, in a way, because he looks like something somebody threw up. After the fight, everyone is returned to their respective positions, and Marl comes back into existence. How? I don't know, it's a kid's game, don't question it. Well, a kid might not have questions, but I do. I mean, what if the king saw her and was like, ew, you got old again, and instead decided to keep banging his great-granddaughter? But that's not what happened. I know, I know, I'm just saying. You know, what if? Ugh. So we go back to Guardia to turn in the princess who went missing, and wouldn't you know it, the Chancellor has framed us for kidnapping the princess. We're arrested and let off the court to stay in trial. The Chancellor tries to bring up our sordid past, but Nick's lack of curiosity may have actually helped him here because he didn't steal the candy and do anything unbecoming a gentleman about town. In fact, he helped a little girl find her kitten, and because of this, Chrono was found innocent but still, for some reason, forced to spend time in jail. So what's the goddamn point of a trial then? There's actually a really good reason for it, but it's later and it's part of the side content, so we probably won't even experience it. Sorry, Nick. After we're taken to the dungeon, the Chancellor lies and tells the Warden that we're to be executed, and it doesn't really matter if we did everything right. The Chancellor will always have the upper hand, so we have no choice but to escape the prison, and because these idiots didn't take my weapons, that's easy enough to do. There's a ton of stuff to explore in the prison, and a lot of items to get, and if you explore thoroughly enough, you find a guy awaiting execution that you could set free. His father owns a shop in town, and if you free him, he'll give you 10 mid-ethers for your trouble and a bit of story. Not a bad deal. The other thing this section does is stealth, and it actually doesn't do a terrible job at it either. 
If you pull off a stealth kill, you immediately knock out the enemy and can loot their unconscious body. There's also a section where you can climb up and down on the wall, and if you explore thoroughly, you'll find a shelter for using later. Like, sometimes it feels like every good idea that someone had got implemented in some way before someone could come into the design meeting talking about scope and limiting said scope to just necessary features. Chrono Trigger is one of those games that just has so much creatively going for it that it's hard to hate this game even if you're not in the turn-based combat. At the end of the dungeon, you're forced to fight a dragon. The head heals the rest of the body, the wheels charge, hitting both of your characters, and the body is... It's just the body that shoots medieval rockets at you. Don't question why, just go with it. Does the combat ever get difficult? Not really. No, the difficulty comes from the fact that every enemy as well as bosses take advantage of a gimmick. And unless you engage with that gimmick, you're gonna be hard pressed to win. Like for instance, this dragon fight. If you don't attack the head first, he'll keep healing himself and you'll never be able to properly take him down. But if you focus the head first, then the wheels, then the rest of him goes down without much of a fight. So the difficulty comes from the order in which you do things, or as is the case with later enemies, whether or not you hit them with a certain skill they're weak to. After defeating the dragon, the entire castle is alerted to your presence, and the only thing left for you to do is to outrun the guards and try to make a break for the front door. But they of course try to catch up to you, and prevent your escape until the princess tries, once again, to keep us from being arrested. And all this happened because you freed the Chancellor in the Middle Ages, and he decided to go with a more radical, more aggressive form of punishment for any crime resembling kidnapping or treason. See, the past has consequences. At least this game is really good at making you think there is. The princess pleads her case and decides that life is better when she's not in a castle being waited on hand and foot. She left behind all that privilege and didn't even need to get into a tiny windowless submarine to do it. But the chancellor isn't gonna let a dead dog lie. He's coming after us. So we run away and jump into the only gate available to us. But where will it take us? When we emerge from the time hole, we find ourselves in a dank, rust-smelling facility. A place that, to Chrono and the rest of the gang, looks completely unfamiliar. I want to see something. What are you doing? I just want to see something. Oh, that's kind of genius. And it looks like the game actually took your decision into account. Normally in games like this, they won't even let you try to do something like that. But not only does this game let you, but it has an answer for whatever you try to throw at it. I'm not used to this kind of thing in JRPGs. I'm sorry you've had such a bad time with the genre. I've gotten to experience the highs and the lows of the genre, and it's because of games like this that I have such fond memories of it. It's not just nostalgia with this game. When you leave the facility, you exit into the world map. There is very little music on this map. There's only the sound of wind whipping through dead valleys accompanied by a drum section of metal expanding in heaps. It's very industrial. I keep coming back to this, but this is the reason I live for this game. The music, it's all just so damn good. Just listen to this. There is nothing else that this song communicates other than some dudes are chasing you. Some would say it's too on the nose, but I think it's communicative. It tells you how to feel when perhaps the graphics on the screen weren't doing such a good job. Doc? Yeah? Shut the fuck up about the music. The first place you come to is a dome, just like the one you exited. Except this one's teeming with hungry people. People just holding out their hands asking if you have any chicken in your pockets. Everyone is hungry and seemingly close to death. If we're looking for a way out of this dump, then this isn't the dome we're looking for. We have to cross a zone that's infested with specters who cannot be harmed by regular attacks. So you're forced to rely on your techniques to dispatch them quickly. After we traverse the zone, we are popped into the open world again, right next to another dome named Eris Dome. And inside, you guessed it, more starving people. But these ones are surprised that you were able to cross the zone and get here. They haven't seen new faces for a long time, let alone ones that don't have flies crawling all over them. These people think that there's some food in this dome, and right now you're in survival mode because unless they have some sort of food to eat, no one, including yourself, is going to survive. So, in order to find said food, the party must traverse the rafters and have a big boss fight at the end, which plays a lot like the dragon fight in that you have to guess which one of its appendages you need to beat up first. 
After the boss goes down, your reward is a corpse of a guy in the middle of a whole bunch of rotten food stores. After playing tag with a giant rat, you'll be given a code to the doors, and this will open up a whole new area for you to explore, fight, and at the end of all of that, you'll get a cutscene. Luca believes she can use these computers to locate another gate. How does she know how to use the computers? Ignore that, it's not important. If this were any other game, you would be jumping on the opportunity to pad out the runtime of this video, but for some reason, this game gets a pass. Moving on, Luca and Morrow uncover a recording. After the dramatics are over, you're forced to pass yet another forbidden zone. And this time, you get to do it on a jet cycle in a race against, well, whatever the fuck this guy is. And after you beat him, he kind of looks down at the ground all sad, kicking rocks while this music plays. I told you this music in this game is an absolute banger. Shut up about the music! After we traverse a robot factory, we find a lone robot, sinning, non-functioning, waiting for someone like Luca to come along and fix him. And for fixing him, he is grateful. We can't get into the inner chamber of the dome because the door ahead is sealed shut, and the power needed to open it has been disabled at the nearby derelict factory. We have a boss fight with an army of robots who proceed the fight by tearing up our robot right in front of us, and after we drag him back to the dome, put him back together again, we confront the fragility of life. into a portal but this portal is different because this one shoots out electricity and shit where will we end up this time you arrive at the end of time a platform floating in a black abyss there are three white gates each representing a time we tore a hole in through the little wooden gate is an old man the old man tells us that when we went through the gate with four people we triggered some sort of exception with the time travel algorithm and we got spat out here at the end of time. We're also told to stay away from the bucket, and let me tell you, point well taken, because the boss fight that's inside that bucket is with Lavos, the very last boss in the game. And while it's not impossible to beat him, I think it's meant as an Easter egg for the people who did the ultimate sacrifice and grinded to beat early game Lavos. I say that because you get a secret ending if you beat it this way, and I thought that was pretty damn cool to see in a game from this era. So because we can only take three people with us through a gate, we have to decide who stays, who goes, and it doesn't really matter which three you take because they're all good choices. You'll want to take and train up everyone on magic, however. I got something I want to say. What's that? Why do I gotta train each new character to use magic? Shouldn't that just be something they inherit? It's just stupid busy work. No, it's not. Then what else is it? It's a mechanic that has you coming back to the fight the guy that keeps kicking your butt. Each time the game gets you to come back, your character is stronger, and therefore you think, maybe now I'm strong enough to beat him. 
so you keep challenging him until you eventually win. I think it's a great mechanic. Sounds like you're just making excuses for a game you like. When we're done screwing around, we're told that there's a guy, the Fiend Lord, and he's gonna try and summon Lavos in 600 AD. So you head to Medina Village 1000 AD, only to find out that the gate had teleported you to the side of the continent inhabited by monsters. You have to traverse a long set of tunnels and fight a boss, and in the end, take a trip through a vortex and get spit cleanly out into the land right outside your friend's house. After hitting up the market and getting our reward from that guy whose life we saved before, we head to the fairgrounds to go through the original gate, and for some reason, that opens up another gate at the end of time. But where will this gate lead us, and how is it getting us closer to stopping the Fiend Lord? You're asking me? Yeah, haven't you been paying attention? No? This is an old game, so there's not a whole lot of hand-holding, and as such, it can get difficult to know what to do next. Here's the premise. You go to the end of time, hop a gate back to the past, 600 AD, which, let's just take a single solitary moment to acknowledge that AD means Anno Domini, which is the year of our Lord, and BC means before Christ. So that means Christ existed in Chrono Trigger. Beg your pardon? Oh. God damn! So anyway, you hop back to the pass and hit up the bridge where the soldiers are stationed. Currently, they're starving because they haven't received supplies for days, and they can't leave the bridge because the army of the Fiend Lord is still pushing forward. Everything depends on you, Nick. Okay, but like, where do I go? So Nick didn't know where to go next, and in fact, went all over the place looking for the next thing he was supposed to do. He even tried looking for a new gate in Medina, and in a normal JRPG from this era, he wouldn't really be able to do things like that. They feel more restrictive and don't really let you wander around, not really. You are supposed to hit a certain goalpost in order to open up more of the overworld map, and most of the time you do that by visiting towns and getting involved in their local dramas. Chrono Trigger does a lot of the same gating, but feels a lot less restrictive given the time travel mechanic has a hub world that you could travel to and from, and the game has a ton of side content to experience. You always have a clearly defined goal, but it's not always easy to tell where you're supposed to go or what you're supposed to do. So in this instance, we've got hungry soldiers. From here, we're supposed to explore the castle and find the men some food. In fact, the guard in gold at the bridge says that the supplies should have arrived from the castle by now. So that should have been a hint. Fucking idiot. So the player knows that they're supposed to look for supplies at the castle, and that will eventually lead them to the cook, who will then deny them their food at first, but come running later offering some spiced jerky for the boys on the front line. After all, his fool brother is out there risking his fool life and some fool's gambit to kill some fool dark elf guy. In other words, he's letting bygones be bygones with his brother by doing his job for you. Look at this lazy asshole doing cardio instead of working. When we return to the bridge, all the men that were blocking the bridge are laying on the ground taking naps. And to make things worse, skeletons are stabbing all the awake people. It's like London on a Monday afternoon. Then we meet Ozzy. Hang on a minute. Why do I feel like I'm playing Dragon Ball Z? Have you ever heard of the name Akira Toriyama? What do you think? Well, Toriyama is the artist behind a Dragon Ball manga, and he worked on the game, and you can really tell that the graphics are dripping wet with his style. He also worked on Dragon Quest, and is probably, maybe, the reason why that game has such a recognizable style, even now, all these years later. Once you've gone through the requisite battle on the bridge, you'll have Ozzy on the back foot, but just when you think you've come to the end of the map and there's nowhere left for him to run, he summons in a bone golem. One half of this guy is resistant to lightning and the other half is resistant to ice. But just like so many other monsters in this game, how easy the fight ends up being is dependent on which appendage you take off first. Of course, it would appear that Nick chose wrong and was getting his ass wrecked for a while there. That's weird. You run into a million monsters and none of them are a challenge until you get to the boss. Why would a game hide the fun part until the end of all the boring parts? Whatever. Nick barely scrapes by and is clearly salty about it. In the nearby village, you can get the lay in the land. Someone named Cyrus went missing and the man with the hero's badge was at the tavern getting absolutely fit-faced and now some kid named Tata is the chosen one. But before we learn that Magus is up there on top of a sheer cliff face, draculaing the villagers below, we learn that the fiends can just walk right through the wall. Eventually, we find out where the kid went, and we head there to find him. Combat in this area will consist of a lot of these guys. They have resistance to most attacks, and their defenses can only be lowered through hitting them with fire. 
I like the visual cue of the wooden hammer, which kind of signals to the player that fire might be effective here. And the animation of the hammer catching fire is our reward for figuring it all out. At the end of an absolute gauntlet of enemies, we come to a dark cave. And in the ground, as if inside an altar, a sword sticks out of the ground, waiting for a new owner to come and claim it. The guardians of the sword, Maza and Mun, will challenge you to a rumble. And when they first fight you, they're two separate assholes. But after that fight proves to be too much for them, they combine into one big swollen looking dude who karate chops wind spells at you. This is a simple endurance race. Can you get the boss down to zero HP before he KOs your whole group? After defeating two children in a battle to the death, they grant you Mazimu, the legendary sword. But not without some disclaimers. Not only is the blade broken, but the hilt is missing. This is why you don't trust children with expensive toys. The first thing we need to do is look for that kid that ran off when we entered the forest, and we can follow his urine trail all the way back to his house where he's hiding underneath the stairs. Turns out the kid is no hero, and in fact, while Frog was drinking, he plucked the badge off the ground. So he's a thief. Once again, he can't trust kids with shit. He was gonna sell it for a couple of Pokemon booster packs, but some people noticed him carrying it around and started calling him a hero, so he just kinda went with it. So now that we have the hero's badge back, it's time to actually give it to the hero, the Frogman. But he's hanging out in the forest, and the only way to find him is to search beneath this specific bush and climb down a hidden ladder. And this is one of those situations where I'm sure some poor kid had to call a hotline and pay $3.99 a minute to find out what the hell he was supposed to do. Inside his underground hideout are the remains of the Mazumune, the hilt and blade guard specifically. With both pieces in hand, it's time to go see the guy who can super glue it all together. Melquire. But he needs a special rock that hasn't existed in thousands of years, so you know what that means. We're going back in time. But before you go there, I suggest you get your robot to go with you. Not because he offers any tactical advantage, but for the dialogue. Chrono hated seeing her leave, but loved to watch her hop away. Then she comes back to kick some more ass, then sexually assaults Chrono against the wall, and after all that, Chrono and the crew are like, hey, have you seen a red rock? And she's like, yeah, come to my village and I'll show you mine. Whatever the hell that means. For all we know, she can meet her clit. You'll get into some fights here, and these guys hit like trucks, but a lot of them do close quarters damage, and as such, are always in range of a cyclone sweep combo. So if you find yourself in range, use it. It's a one hit kill for groups and it's a great way to grind out currency in this area which can be used to trade for powerful items like the ruby vest, which is resistant to fire, and weapons for each of your characters. After we arrive in the chief's hut, we're told that there's gonna be a party thrown in our honor. Which is cool and all, but I can't help but feel like saying Ooga Booga is offensive to cavemen. Or at the very least, ghosts. Talk to everyone in the area to experience the vibes, and eventually you'll learn that Isla has the big red rock that you're looking for, but you won't get it until you participate in a drinking contest, in which you are likely drinking something very deadly, maybe poisonous, and definitely not for kids. And afterwards, you black out, and when you come to, you find out that someone has stolen your virginity. And I guess he took all your shit too. At this point, you have two choices. You can go straight to the objective, which is down south, or you can go up north and grind out currency to upgrade your gear. You don't have to do that, and you'll probably be fine, but it does, admittedly, make the game a bit easier when you have the best gear on. Once we're done grinding, we head down south to the forest maze, and we meet Isla's boyfriend. Apparently, he saw us as a threat, like we were moving in on his girl, and he decided to steal our stuff while we were roofied, and not only did he steal our stuff, but the dumbass went and got his stuff stolen from him as well. 
Now we have to go into the maze, crush some dino skulls, and steal our gate key back so we can get back to our time to fix Mazumu. The place is actually pretty long. You go through the forest maze and kill about 100 prehistoric dinos, monkeys with wings, shit like that. Then you go into a cave where giant whatever the hell these things are dig holes leading the floors below this one. One thing I need to highlight are these fat bastards right here. If you hit them with lightning, their defense is lowered to the point where you can actually kill them. Otherwise, you'll be wearing them down like a river through the Grand Canyon. It'll take years. After you've gone through the maze, you meet the big bad reptite herself, Azala. She's got our gate key and she's not giving it up until we beat her husband, Nisbil. This guy, like the fat bastards we fought before, is weak to lightning, but he has a mechanic where after a handful of seconds after using lightning, he'll discharge it back onto you and damage everybody in your group. You could not use it, but that just means it'll take forever to kill him while he bodies you with earthquake attacks. If you took Marl instead of Robo, which is actually a pretty good idea, I guess I should have told you that sooner. You think? If you took Marl, you can use Ice Sword Tech, and after you use Lightning, it'll do considerable damage to the bodybuilding Reptite. After we're done fighting Nisbal, Azala freaks out and throws our gate key on the ground and runs off like a little bitch. And then Isla throws up from her hangover, I guess. Now it's time to head back up the mountain and hop off the cliff and into the gate and back to our original timeline. Melkwar will be at his house waiting for us, and after a short cutscene in which Robo helps Melkwar put the pieces together, we are presented with the thing we travel millions of years to get. Mazamune. The only thing left to do is return to the little froggy with the hero's badge. We've heard rumors in town that the fiends are able to walk through the wall in the Magic Mountains, so that's the first place we should go, and when we get there, we're treated to a kick-ass cutscene. And after that, we traverse a cave full of bats and rats and end up outside of Magus's manor. The manor seems to be full of people, but like the cathedral, we know better. They all say creepy shit too, like something you'd see a Japanese kid say in a horror movie while crawling up the walls and disappearing like a black widow crawling into your house the moment you open the door. After you've explored the place thoroughly, you'll find Ozzy waiting for you in the main hall. He tells you that his other two bandmates, Flea and Slash, are gonna make a mincemeat out of your face. So our next objective is to go and have a shred session with Slash and Flea to find out once and for all who can masturbate a guitar neck faster. If you pick Marl as your companion, you'll have access to Ice Water, which will one-shot all of the monster groups in this place except for these genie-looking guys. They are weak, however, to Chrono's Cleave, so hit the group with Ice Water first, then hit them with Cleave and regular attacks. In the fight against Flea, you want to stay away from using magic attacks and instead rely on high damaging physical attacks like X-Strike. In fact, regular attacks work pretty well against him, her? It's a question that not even the wiki of the game can answer. Let's just say they're between genders at the moment and leave it at that. Slash is basically immune to water attacks I used against him, so use whatever attacks with the highest damage output that you have available. And when he kicks into his second phase, make good use of Frog and Marl's healing abilities. 
and attack when you're close to full health again. The only enemy left is Ozzy, and he tries to put you through a crazy train's worth of traps and pitfalls, and when you get to the end, his 80-year-old ass falls down some steps and breaks his neck. You don't even get a proper boss fight with him, which is a good thing because the final fight with Magus is kind of a pain in the ass. Magus has a shield that he'll constantly rotate between light, shadow, ice, and fire. What I did was hit him with the Mazimune, then hit him with Cleave. This forces Magus to change his barrier, and when he finally changes to a barrier type that gives you an opening, hit him with Maza, and then hit him with a spell. It'll do large chunks of damage to his health. Once you get his second phase, he'll let down his barriers in order to hit you with an all-out attack. Make sure your HP is maxed out for those attacks or you'll party wipe. When he drops his barrier, hit him with as many physical and magical attacks as you can, use combos, and your most damaging techniques because this guy has 6,666 hit points and it takes a while to take him down. When we finally beat him, he's surprised that Frog can wield a weapon as well as he can. And he remarks that he didn't create Lavos, that Lavos has been here before any of them were alive and he simply summoned him. Lavos awakens, the energy starts crackling in the air, and now all of us are sucked into a large gate caused by the disturbance that the ancient creature created. Then we wake up, but we wake up in a timeline we recognize, except it's all wrong. We're married tomorrow, and she's complaining about how we need to get off our lazy ass, get out of bed, and find a job. And I personally felt attacked by this as if the game were reaching through space-time to speak to me specifically. Then we wake up, for real this time, and we're back in 35 million BC, which if you remember, stands for before Christ, and Isla already diddled all of you while you were asleep. Isla is watching over us as we sleep, and when we wake up, we're informed by a sweaty villager that someone has attacked and burned down a nearby settlement. So we head over to the area where all the fires are, and we find out that this is the work of the Reptites, and because of Isla's war with them, the dinos have been taking it out on the villages that cannot defend themselves. The chief blames her for all the destruction, and she responds with a familiar talking point. Might equals right. Victory to the strong. And as long as you're winning, you get to keep on breathing. It's real survival of the fittest type shit back in the stupid ages. Turns out that the Reptites took Isla's boy toy, Kino, with them, and she's got a plan to get him and all the other villagers back. And you know what the plan is? The plan is to ride some pterodactyls to the big lizard of Zala's fortress and take the fight to the reptites. Then we head back to the dactyl's nest and you can pretty much run past all these fights. But like before, if you feel like grinding out currency, the elder has a bunch of new stuff for you, which could come in handy for the next couple of boss fights. But honestly, you don't really need it. I did fine without them, but if you want to get that extra edge, you know what to do. Once you get to the top of the nest, you'll see Isla up there praising the sun, and in the distance, a red star is glimmering in the sky. At this point, the entire map is open to you. I suggest going back to the end of time and restocking your healing items at one of the shops in the Middle Ages or present time before heading into the Tyranno Lair. Once there, you'll want to explore the castle thoroughly to get your hands on some very good gear before heading on to release the hostages in the first set of cages. Then releasing Kino, or should I say, letting Isla free him by climbing into the cage with him and breaking the bars with her pure berserker strength. 
Once free, Kino will open a new passage for us and hightail it out of the castle. This place is absolutely infested with enemies to fight and a lot of them you can't simply run past. Nah, this place is friggin' annoying. Why don't they have a system where you can avoid fights if you can spend about 65% of the time fighting in fights you can't possibly avoid? Yeah, I think I'm inclined to agree with you there. Really? I didn't think you could talk with the game's dick that far in your mouth. Hey, just because I like the game doesn't mean I can't see its flaws. Later on, you'll come to a boss fight, and it's a repeat fight with the same guy you fought the last time you were here, Nisbel. And he's just as easy as the last time, which is to say he's a pain in the ass that will have you constantly healing until you spin kick him to death. Then at the end of the Gauntlet of Enemies, you'll fight Azala and her pet Tyrannosaurus. This fight is fairly easy. It follows the obvious rules from boss fights before. First, you target Azala, and when she's finally dead, then you can focus down her pet. And on its second phase, it does an all-out attack, so in a way, it's a lot like the fight with Magus. You go all out when he's gathering strength, and make sure your HP is topped off before the thing lets you have a face full of fire. About three rounds of this, and you'll kill the Tyrannosaurus. After the fight, Azala has some words for you. She laments that the heavens have decided to side with the hairless apes, and goes on to tell us that a great fiery stone will fall from the sky and scorch the earth, and that rock is the big red star in the sky. That big star is none other than the very same Lavos that we've been trying to protect the future from. Turns out that this thing is not just a couple of hundred years old, but millions of years old, and it's been resting in the earth's surface, feeding on the energy of the planet, waiting for an opportunity to arise and take the world out and everything on it. We emerge from the cave into a harsh, desolate place. At least it looks that way at first, until you find the freaking floating city above the ice where people just sort of lay around all day, dreaming, they say. But I think these people are on drugs because no way you can get me to sleep all day long unless you fed me some of that gas station Delta 8 edible shit. The people talk about how there's not much difference between the waking world and the world of dream, but seriously, that's just because they're all high as shit and the lead bitch in charge is becoming different somehow. People talk about how she's not to be messed with, and that pretty much is obvious when you meet her, because this guy in the cloak and hood, well, I think he's pretty damn obvious that this guy is Magus, and this little dude with the cat is Little Magus. He can't really be sure what his plan is yet, but apparently the queen is siphoning some of the power from Lavos and using it to power all the cool floating cities and technology. And the longer they do that, the more Lavos' evil influence changes her. We meet someone named Shala, who is Magus' older sister, and before we could talk to her, the Queen's assistant comes bursting in and demands that Shala go see the Queen, and says, and I quote, If we're late, I fear I'll be, well, you know the Queen. Sounds like it'll be painful. So, we follow Shala, and that leads us to the Queen's chamber, and instead of exchanging banter, names, things like that, Magus, the guy in a robe, throws us under the bus, and the queen throws us in a containment field to be tortured to death. Neat. But then Shala and little Magus Vert let us out of the cage, and Biggie Magus steps in to interrupt it all. He insists that throwing us into the gate and sealing the gate behind us is the only way to save our lives, and we're forced to find another way back to the past. But while we're in the past, we charge Marl's pendant with some magical energy from Lavos that allows us to open not only the magically sealed chests, but also the magically sealed doors. And it just so happens that there's a ton of doors to open in a future timeline. So it's time we go back. To the future! Uh, is it okay to have two Back to the Future jokes in one video? Once we're thrown into the gate, we emerge to the distant past. 35 million years in the past to be precise, and we have to fight our way back to the working gate here to end up at the end of time. From here, we travel back to the post-apocalypse time, and this time we have to go through the sewers to get to the dome that we're looking for. I went to every single dome in this place before I even tried to go through the sewers. 
It was one of the most frustrating experiences I've had in a video game because the sewers were the last place I thought I needed to go. But on the bright side, you did find a bunch of items you wouldn't have found otherwise. Yeah, and it was mostly shit I couldn't use. I want that half hour of my life back. From here, I recommend you go through every time period for the magically sealed chests and to get the ruby vest at 35 million BC. Because there is going to be a fight later that will absolutely crush you if you're not wearing that armor that protects you from dark magic and fire magic. I mean, I'm not even sure if you could beat this guy without that armor because he hits like a truck and has two attacks per round. It's kind of bullshit. Hey, you're telling me! I only had two deaths this entire playthrough, so and both of them were from this asshole right here. So anyway, you head through the sewers, and I need to point this one bit out because this is genius. And by genius, I mean it's the furthest thing from friggin' genius you can get. We got stuck on this part and ended up having to look up a walkthrough because I couldn't figure out how to make it past the sewers. Apparently, this area right here that looks like a dead end, it's not a dead end. You go through here and through the door and you'll emerge into the wasteland next to the Keeper's Dome. Inside the dome you'll find a time travel machine called the Epoch and this will allow you to head back to the time of antiquity. When you finally go back to 13,000 BC, you'll have two boss fights, one with a mud imp and his two bulls. Each bull is allergic to a different element, and the mud imp is basically strong against everything. I beat him by targeting the bulls first, but part of me thinks it would be easier to just kill him first. Try both to see which one is easier for you. Then after the big fight, you'll ascend a massive chain into a floating maze which is connected by more chains, and at the end of that, a gauntlet of monsters. You're supposed to come to the place where Melquire is being held captive, but instead, this happens. So in a single round, this guy managed to take more than half of your entire group's HP. This is why you need the vests you get out of the Elder in 35 million BC and the mystical chest throughout the game. Equip each of your group with the Dark Mail, Ruby Vest, or any of the armors that have absorbed Dark or Fire. And instead of hurting you, they'll heal you. Watch how the opening of this boss fight goes when you're wearing the correct armor. And that's with me not even having all the best armors to fight this guy, and it still went fairly easy. Basically, I targeted the right hand because it heals the head, and used my triple combo tech on the head. And every time the hand resurrected, I would use the triple tech on it to get rid of it. While this guy only has one arm, he cannot use his most devastating attacks, but the left hand is still able to do some wicked damage, so you might want to just take out both hands if you're able to, just to have an easier time. He will revive both his hands after a time, so you need to be careful to never allow him to have both hands up at the same time, or he'll do his bullshit combo attack. After you defeat Giga Gaia, Melaquire will be released from his prison, and the mountain he was imprisoned on will fall from the sky. And this is, apparently, not a world-ending event, as it probably should have been. In fact, everything seems to be fine. Shallot comes back and she has a heart to heart with Melquire, and then some guy named Dalton comes into the bar and starts beating a bunch of people up and he roadhouses his way to victory, taking both Little Magus and Shallow with him back to the Queen. Now we have to stop the Queen. What are we stopping her from? Who knows, but it involves an ancient star beast from beyond time, so we should probably not let her do whatever she's about to do. But before we could do any of that, we have to have a fight with Dalton. And before he can even roundhouse kick us out the door, we hit him with triple techs a couple of times and he was toast. We go through a gate that then teleports us to a temple under the sea. In this place, we got some of the hardest enemies in the game so far, because of course we do. See these eyeball imps? They're immune to all but one type of magic, and that magic varies from imp to imp, so you can't just cast your most powerful magics, 
because they will likely counter them with powerful magics of their own and likely kill you the first time you run into them, like they did with Nick. For these guys, you're best off using your most powerful physical attacks. We just set ours to auto battle and did just fine, though we did need to heal more often than we probably should have. Then you run into three different versions of the same guy in the same fight, and when you do, they use a triple tech on you that really tanks your health, and you need to kill all of one type of color quickly before they kill you with their techs. Then as we get closer to the queen, we meet up with Maza. You see, earlier Melquire gave us a knife made of Dreamstone to use on the Mammon machine. Dreamstone is the same substance we needed to fix Mazimune, and Lean's pendant was made with it as well. We're supposed to stab the machine with the knife, but before we could do that, we have to fight one of the hardest bosses in the game, and that is the double golem fight. You may disagree with this, but this fight is a ball buster to me because they attack so quickly that it's hard to get the upper hand unless you have enough red mails and ruby vests to protect your characters with. That will help you survive the volley of fire that they shoot at you long enough to get off your triple techs. These guys have about 6,000 HP apiece, so three or four of those attacks should be enough to kill them. Burying the sword inside the machine was not enough to stop the summoning of Lavos. And you can now try to fight him, but it's more likely that he'll kill you in a single hit. If you do somehow manage to put a dent in his outer shell, you'll get another secret ending called the Programmer's Ending. This is the ending I was talking about earlier in the video where you get to talk to the team that worked on the game. It's a cool ending and all, but getting it must be a massive pain in the booty hole. Anyway, we get one shot by the big man, and we get treated to a tragic cutscene of our favorite mute protagonist getting absolutely obliterated. The temple starts shaking and the floating mountain comes crashing down into the sea. This time, instead of causing a slight inconvenience, the falling rocks cause a tidal wave that nearly wipes out all of the life on the surface of the planet. We wake up in a cave with the earthbound people and after we exit, we're ambushed by Dalton and his cronies and kidnapped. This place is kind of a pain in the ass. Basically the goal here is to find the chest that has each of your companion's gear in it, the party inventory, and the money you've accumulated. The enemies in this area are an absolute pushover if you've brought Isla with you. You wake up trapped in a, well, I guess it's a cell, and you have more than one way out of it, which is a nice little touch that you just don't see in games like this. You can either climb out of the place and take the rafters, which is the safer bet, or you can pretend to be sick and ambush the guards when he comes in to check on you. It's, it's very nice, much RPG. We spend nearly a half hour scouring this place, walking into rooms randomly like an idiot, getting into fights. What I suggest is you start with the northern part of the map and visit each room west to east as you work your way south, and that way you'll get all the chests that you're looking for. Make sure you don't proceed any further in the area before you get all your items, and this will make the rest of the game that much easier on you. When you are finally ready to leave, run through this door, and you'll know the place by the fact that it's the only room that has another door inside of it. Head through the door, up the ladder, and onto the wing. I've been up on this wing a hundred times, and I haven't seen an exit once. That's because there isn't an exit. See, what you're supposed to do is somehow divine that you have to go to the bottom left-hand corner of the screen where there is nothing, 
absolutely nothing that would draw you there and have a boss fight with a golem who is too afraid to attack you because of the heights. There are many parts in this game which are obtuse and misleading at times and this is just another one of those times that the design kind of falls flat on its face. After the boss fight, you'll hop down onto the wing of your time machine and have another joke of a boss fight with Dalton. You can basically put this fight on auto and you'll probably still win. After the boss fight is over, you'll have to restart the Epox engine. But if you hit the wrong button, you'll fire a bunch of missiles at the Blackbird and crash it into the ocean. Once you've got the epoch back in the air, you'll land it back outside the settlement of the earthbound people and head up to the top of the nearest mountain. Atop the mountain, you'll find our favorite broody boy, Magus, or Janus, or whatever you want to call him, and he'll reveal his secret. His secret was that he was the little boy all along! GASP! But then you'll get an opportunity to fight him or spare his life, and in any other JRPG you'll have two choices, but only one choice would work, and you'd likely be forced to kill him, but in this game, it's like the developers were like, yeah, what if we didn't do any of the things that JRPGs are known for, and instead did the opposite of those things, and it really worked out here. If only they followed that same philosophy when designing the combat system. If you kill Magus, you'll end up freeing the frog from his curse and turn him back into a real boy. If you spare Magus' life, he'll join your crew, and he's one of the best magic users in the game. Very versatile. After we talk to Magus, it's revealed that Lavos created several gates after we were teleported out of there, and he scattered Balthazar, Melquar, and Magus to different time periods. That's how we were able to meet Melquar in the present day, and why he was able to create Mazamun in 13,000 BC, which stands for Before Christ, as you well know. Magus' whole goal in life has been to kill Lavos, and we just keep getting in the way, but we saw in our fight against him, Magus didn't stand a chance. So now we've been defeated by Lavos and our lead character has been killed. All would appear lost, but Magus says he's got a way to bring Chrono back, if we bring him with us. But it's going to require a super frustrating trip to the present to win a clone of Chrono and the future apocalypse to find Balthazar, or at least what remains of him. To win a clone of Chrono, we have to go back to Lean Square in the present day and compete in the game of Simon Says with Chrono's Doppel Doll. And what is supposed to happen is you're supposed to beat the doll, and if you do well enough, the doctor will grant you a clone free of charge. But we did that, and he still wanted the charges for the doll. To get the doll, we needed to raise 60,000 monies, and we did not have 60,000 monies to spend. So what we did instead was head to the post-apocalypse and fly over to the Genodome, or the Genocide Dome. At this point, the entire game world is open to you, and you can do things in basically any order you want. All the character side quests are open to you, and they all reward your characters with powerful items that will be useful in defeating Lavos at the end of the game. But the Genodome is known for one thing, in my opinion, and that is chests full of money. In fact, there are two chests in this place that will net you about 90,000 G, which is more than enough to buy the clone of Chrono. So once you've completed the character side quests, and you've gained enough money to pay for the doll, head over to the square and fight the robot so you can get 40 silver points, and then head over to the tent with the skull on it. Compete and win the doll, or compete and fail and buy the doll. Either way, your next stop is to head back to the future. Head back to the Keeper Dome and talk to the new that holds Balthazar's memories, and he will create little dolls that will help you climb Death's Peak. Death's Peak holds multiple Lavo spawns, which are essentially smaller versions of Lavos, and if you attack the shell, it'll respond by hitting you with a devastating counterattack that hits your entire group. I got something to say, okay? I've been playing this game for a while now, and I feel like I have only seen two different mechanics for each fight. Kill this first, or don't use X on Y. That's my main problem with these types of games. They lean on two mechanics that they can never do anything different, and every fight is either easy because you already know the mechanic, or a drag to play through because you spend most of your time healing your party. Yeah, I'm gonna have to agree with you on that. By the end of a JRPG, I'm usually plum tuckered out or just wore out by the mechanics because there's really only so much you could do with turn-based combat formulas. I should actually clarify, there's a lot that you could do with turn-based combat, but not when positioning is impossible. If these kinds of games had maneuvering, cover mechanics, you know, anything to do with positioning, tactics would be, you know, a thing. 
Instead, the tactics you can employ are fairly shallow compared to other more modern turn-based games, which is of course to be expected. I mean, the original game fit onto a 32 megabit cartridge, so there's only so much that could have been done at the time. So, so criticizing it for not being more modern is, you know, kind of fucking dumb. Ah, whatever. Now, after you climb the apex of the mountain, the time egg you're carrying will shatter, and for a moment, you'll believe that nothing can be done to bring Chrono back. But then this happens. When you get to the end of time, it's a good idea to look up the side quests and talk to your companions and the old man. You'll get insight into how to do those quests, but I want to rant about this for a moment because I never did these quests in any of my playthroughs because some of them are downright obtuse and hard to figure out due to how they're structured. For instance, Frog's quest requires that you go back to the Middle Ages to find a carpenter to fix the holes in the floor of the Northern Ruins, but he doesn't have his tools because someone stole them. So you're supposed to know that you have to go back to the present to talk to another carpenter who is too lazy to work and get his tools from him. Then go back to the middle ages and give the tools to the carpenter in that time period and he will fix the holes for you. I'm sure that this was in some Nintendo power somewhere, but I'll be damned if that kind of design is something I like. I'm not even sure how someone figures that out without wandering around aimlessly talking to every last person in town. I know that I had to look up a walkthrough to get through some of the side content in this game, but regardless of that, it's good to do the side content because it brings closure to each character's backstory, and it gets mentioned in the ending if you do them. Team composition is going to be important here. You want a group that has a triple attack combo, but also a group that has two people who can heal. There's a couple of people that fit that requirement. Robo and Frog both have group heal abilities, and in combo they have a very powerful group heal. I took Frog and Isla because of the damaging attacks that both characters have and the slurp kiss combo, which heals the whole group for about half of their max HP. Plus Isla has the triple kick move, which is a very high damaging single target attack that hits for about 1500 points and or more later on. The Black Omen is a big old pain in the ass. If you come here before you're level 45, you might have a hard time with some of the early enemies. But as you progress through the Black Omen, you'll be well above level 45. Especially if you do some grinding, let alone the AEXP that you get from fighting the bosses. And boy, does this place have some bosses. First, you fight the same boss three times, Mega Mutant, Giga Mutant, and his final form, Terra Mutant. On each of these fights, you target the bottom part of the mutant with your strongest attacks, but if you have Nova Armor and the Vigilant Helm, the bottom part of the mutant can no longer put status effects on you. In fact, that armor will get you through most of the fights in this place without getting confused, but it doesn't protect you against lock for some reason. Certain enemies can still lock you out of your abilities and items, so be wary of them. Just attack the eye in the middle, and the rest of the eyes will run away. Then later on, you'll fight another Lavo spawn. And this guy is just like the others you fought, except a little more powerful. Do the same thing you did with the other enemies, and aim for the head until he hits you with a spawn needle attack or something else that requires a heal. Then you come to the part that will really give you heart palpitations. You have to fight not one, 
not two, not even three, but four bosses in a row without dying before you get to a save point. And the final boss, Lavos' outer shell, acts as a boss rush. So you fight every major story boss in the game over again, in a row, but they do allow you to heal up and change your equipment in between each fight, so that's good. Now that sounds like a lot, but the boss rush is a pushover because all the bosses are as strong as the time when you first fought them, which means at your current level, you'll be one-shotting a lot of these bosses. Once that's over with, you get to fight the second form of Lavos, so it's technically five bosses in a row, but this version of Lavos' shell is a joke and you can easily kill him without so much as a close call. I don't care how easy these bosses are. I need a vacation after chopping all those hands off and stabbing all those faces. The second form of Lavos, however, is not screwing around. We went into the fight around level 47, which on the strategy wiki page for Chrono Trigger, it says that you should be at least 45, but at 47, he one-shots us and kills most of our team before I can even pick a command, so it's off to grind some more. Dude, this is one of your favorite games? I honestly don't remember it being this grindy before. Luckily, if you do all the side quests, it's not as grindy, but as I said before, you may need a guide to point you to all the side quest content. Now, if you don't feel like doing all that side content, I have a grinding spot that will level you up to 55 quickly without a whole lot of screwing around. I have two of them, in fact. The best place to grind would be the conveyor belt of the Genodome. But if you've already done Rob's side quest, then the dome will no longer have the enemies you need. If that happens to you, then head over to Death's Peak to the point where those jellies and eggshells come tumbling down the mountain. Put combat on auto and give Isla the Berserker Ring so that her attack goes up. She'll one-shot these things and you'll blow through them quickly. It took me about an hour to gain 8 levels. At level 55, Lavos is an absolute pushover. This form needs to have both arms killed as quickly as possible to avoid his most devastating attack. But I've seen it work when you only kill one arm, so... Focus the right arm, which has the least amount of hit points, then target the left arm. Once both arms are killed, use a triple tech on the body to take it down as quickly as possible. Then you have his final form. This final form is tricky. See, the game has been setting you up this entire time. It taught you that the center guy, the body, is the guy you need to kill. But first you need to kill the appendages, but not this time. This time, your target is not the core, but the bit on the right. That guy is the real Lavos. Unfortunately, that bit cannot be harmed until its defenses have been brought down. So you need to target the left bit first, the one that heals the core, and kill it. Then the right bit will drop its defenses so you can damage it while it tries to resurrect the left bit. You'll need to do this two or three times depending on a few factors. For instance, Nick, stupidly, left the Berserk Ring on Isla and couldn't control her to get off the triple attack combos. Sad face emoji. The screen fades to black and the sound of the lean bell in the square chimes in the background. Someone is trying to wake you up. The king of your time period is still not happy with Chrono, and he sent a guard to tell you all about it. Apparently, your stay of execution has been rescinded, and you're to accompany this guard to the castle. But it's not really an execution. It's a surprise party, and all your friends are invited, and depending on the side quest you did, this ending changes slightly to account for your actions. A parade is thrown in your honor, and at the end, 
all of your good buds that you've been traveling with decided to go back home, make babies, become knights, and disappear into nothing, and before the gate can close completely, your mom jumps into it. And how, Chrono, do you feel about your mom disappearing forever? You're a terrible son.